Good morning and happy Easter Sunday to you all. Um, I uh, love Easter. It's interesting, isn't it? Well, often we get really excited by Christmas and we plan it for weeks and weeks ahead of time. Um, and I love uh, Christmas. I love the whole buying presents and the decorations and all of that stuff. And hopefully the snow, I'd lo love a bit more of that, but we don't seem to do so well on that these days, do we? But I love Christmas and I love the excitement of God coming near. But an interesting thing is actually the real heart of the Christian message and the real heart of our faith is all about Easter and it's about the fulfillment of that little baby that grew up to become a man who then walked on the earth in the places that we walk and face the situations that we face and then was willing to hang on a cross and take the punishment that should have been ours for all the things we've done wrong which is what we uh, reflected on and remembered on Good Friday, uh, probably. And then on Easter Sunday, we uh, uh, celebrate the fact that that same God, that Jesus, who took all of that sin and punishment and shame and sickness and sorrow into himself, three days later, he rose victorious from the dead. So we can celebrate his gift of overcoming and breaking the power of sin and breaking the power of death. And we can stand in new life, reunited with God because of the work of Jesus on the cross. So Easter Sunday really is a great time to celebrate. I'm aware I kind of feel like I should have an equivalent of a Christmas pullover, but they don't make them for Easter, do they? But it is a wonderful day to be able to celebrate the work of Jesus. It's often, uh, quite often, a great family day as well. Maybe you're rushing off and spending time with family later. Thank you for spending some time to tune in and to have the opportunity to refocus ourselves on Easter Sunday and say thank you to God for the amazing work of the cross. I'm going to read uh, one of the stories of resurrection. Each of the Gospels, of course, ends with the story of the resurrection. Um, and uh, I'm going to read John's uh, story uh, of the resurrection, 18 verses from John chapter 20. And then I'm going to give a really simple message this morning, three T's. See if you can work them out while I'm reading the passage. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who'd reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but she did not realise it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, don't hold on to me for I've not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told him that, she, that he had said these things to her. It's a great, great uh, story. It's a great, great recounting of it, isn't it? There's uh, lots of uh, great details in it. And like I said, we're going to look at the grand sweep, so not so much at the details, probably. But a few good things to note. One of the things I love is that uh, John, who wrote this account, uh, points out a number of times that he ran to the tomb faster than Peter. In fact, I think he points it out three times, which is, uh, I just love the human touches in the Gospels and the way they recount it. It's not that like it was important that John was a faster runner, but he did want to point out that 
that when they ran, when they heard uh, what Mary said and they ran to the tomb, he got there first, uh, which um, I, maybe, I, maybe I can weed myself into that story. Um, but I find that uh, uh, quite uh, amusing. Um, I love the fact as well that when, she, then when Mary looks into the tomb, um, she sees two angels at the head and the foot of where Jesus' body lay. And uh, if you're looking for uh, references back to the Old Testament, you'll know that the Ark of the Covenant uh, rested in a gold uh, uh, box. And on top of the gold box were two angels with wings uh, uh, that touched. And, uh, and it was called the mercy seat, but it was the place where the presence of God dwelt. And uh, for Mary, she kind of gets a New Testament picture of it as uh, she looks into the tomb and she sees two angels uh, and they're either side of where the body of Jesus had been. And Jesus obviously is God's presence with us. But the three things I simply want to bring out of the story today, three T's really. I want to talk uh, briefly about a tomb. I want to talk about a transformation and I want to talk about a testimony, a tomb, a transformation and a testimony. And it starts off and it says early on the first day of the week. Don't you just love that as well? That, uh, that when Jesus rises from the dead, it opens up a whole new chapter, a whole new week, a whole new day, a whole new era for mankind. So uh, wonderfully appropriate that it comes on the first day of the week. While it was, but while it was still dark, because the disciples hadn't yet recognised what had happened, they were still living in darkness. They still did not understand, it says partway through the, the chapter. So there's, there's a light that still needs to dawn for them of what this all means. Um, but it starts with Mary and a group of women going to the tomb. Just a, another little point of detail, the last people at the cross was a group of women. The first people who discovered the resurrection was a group of women. And obviously in the culture of the day, think Middle Eastern today, uh, women were regarded as second class citizens. And yet actually in the whole Jesus story, he elevated and included women and valued women like never before. And I think it's so beautiful that when all the guys had run away and failed, and denied. It was the women that stayed faithful. And because of that, God first revealed his resurrection to them. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But these women, they went to the tomb because normal practice would be that you would anoint a body uh, after someone had died. It was one of the ways you honoured their life. It was one of the ways that you uh, preserved uh, the body from the stench of decay, that you would anoint the body. And so these women went and they went to a tomb. And they went to a tomb because Jesus had died, but actually the tomb was representative of death. And the reality, it says in the Bible that um, the wages of sin, and the word sin is a catch-all term, that means for everything we've done wrong, for all the things that we are ashamed of, all the things that we feel guilty of, all of the things, things that no, uh, we've done that have been less than how God would have us to live. That all comes under the catch-all term of sin. Actually, literally, the Greek word for sin mean, is an archery term. And it's the word you would use for missing the target, which is probably what would happen if I had to go at archery this morning. Uh, and I would have the bow and arrow uh, and I'd uh, try and do it well, but I would probably miss the mark. And that's what the word sin is. It's a catch-all term for every turn, time that we've missed the mark. Um, but because by missing the mark, because of not living... Uh, in a way that honours God in the world. It puts a gap between us and God. It says in Isaiah uh, 59, it says that our iniquities, our, our crossing boundaries, that literally means our crossing wrong boundaries, our stepping outside of the ways that we should have lived. Because of that, it says it separated us from God. And uh, in the book of Romans, uh, Paul writes and he says the wages of sin, our just deserts for that is death. Um, that actually we all deserve to be punished for the things that we've done wrong. And, uh, and so that means that actually our rightful place is a place of death. And, uh, and for us, as we get separate from God, it is like something physically dies within us. Our connection with God dies within us, but so many of God's hopes and dreams and plans and purposes for our lives, they die as well. And we end up living in a place of death when we're meant to be living in a place of life. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul puts, uh, Paul puts it this way. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you lived according to this world and, uh, and according to the ruler of the kingdom of the earth, of the air. And so what Paul is saying is that actually separate from God, because of the things we've done wrong, we end up in a place of death. 
And that place of death is a tomb um, where we're not alive in the way that we're meant to be alive. You know, in, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, the enemy, the thief, comes to steal, kill and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and life in all its fullness. And when we live separate from God, we're not experiencing life in all its fullness. And so we experience suffering, we experience p pain, we experience loss, and uh, we have no antidote for it. We have no way past it. And we end up being like this tomb that was a dark place, that was a closed off place. And we don't know, just like the women went and they thought, I don't know how we're actually going to get in the tomb <laughs> to uh, uh, anoint the body of Jesus because a huge stone was in the way. But they go in a way because they know the right thing to do is to uh, anoint the body of Jesus. Equally, I think they go because they're so full of sorrow because the Jesus that they loved, the Jesus that they saw perform the amazing miracles, the Jesus that included them in a radical way, that Jesus has died and they don't yet understand that God was going to raise him from the dead. And so when they go, they go weeping and they go with heads uh, bowed low um, because all of their hopes and dreams have been dashed. Maybe this morning, if you honestly reflected on your life, you know there's a number of things that you feel guilty about, you feel ashamed about, that you know you've done, that have caused pain to others, that have caused loss to yourself, and for whom you wish there was a way out or a remedy. Maybe this morning you're carrying sorrows and grief, things that haven't worked out the way that you thought they were going to be, losses that you've carried in your life, and it's weighed you down. That's what these women, uh, that's what they represent in their journey to a tomb. And the tomb represents a place of death. But the good news is that in Easter, we celebrate a God who's brought transformation. One of the famous, uh, one of my favourite verses that I love in the Bible is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, and it says this, it says, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, God made him who was perfect, another way of translating it, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That's what it means on Good Friday for Jesus to take on all the sin and uh, darkness and suffering of the world. That's why when Jesus was hanging on the cross, it went dark for three hours. All the darkness of human history poured out on the life of Jesus. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, in him we might exchange our darkness our sorrow, our sadness, we might know in exchange for his forgiveness, his life, his washing clean, that everything that Jesus carried might be given to us and we might be able to give all of our badness to Jesus and experience all of his goodness flowing into our lives. And that's the good news of Easter Sunday because of the work of Jesus, but because he overcame that darkness and that sickness and that sorrow, because he blasted his way out of the tomb on Easter Sunday, he offers us a divine exchange. We can bring all of our sorrows, we can bring all of our sadness, we can bring all of our sickness, we can bring it all to him and we can leave it with him, let go of it, throw it off ourselves, leave it at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, will you come and give me a new start? Love in uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, chapter 17, says, if anyone is joined to Christ, in other words, if anyone puts their trust in Jesus, if anyone invites Jesus into their heart, if anybody asks Jesus to become Lord of their life, if anyone is joined to Christ, he's a new creation, she's a new creation, she's a new create, a creature, she's got a new life, she's got a new start, she's got a new hope. It's the wonderful divine exchange that Jesus offers for us. And we see this so beautifully in the life, in the story of Mary, because in verse 11, after Peter and John have raced to the tomb and seen there's no Jesus there, Mary sits there outside the tomb and she sits crowded in by her sorrow and a grief and a sense of loss. And, uh, and a sense of loss seems to have been heightened by they've even stolen Jesus' body now. And she is totally engulfed by grief and loss. So much so that when she turns around and sees Jesus, she can't even recognise him. And isn't that the way sometimes with grief and sorrow and loss, it distorts our perspective on reality. 
and everything seems gloomy. Everything seems, so we, we become like Eeyore in the Winnie the Pooh stories. We can't see anything optimistic, you know, any Tigger-like bounce has disappeared and all we have is the Eeyore grumpiness. And that's the position that Mary is in. Her whole perspective, her whole view is, is uh, totally consumed with a sense of grief and loss. And then suddenly, Jesus calls her name. One word, Mary. And it's like the scales drop from her eyes and she sees, oh, it's Jesus, oh, he's alive. And she doesn't maybe still comprehend really the significance of all that's happened, but she sees Jesus. And I love the beauty of Jesus speaking her name. And maybe this morning, Jesus wants to speak your name and say, Alice, this is for you. Stephen, this is for you. John, this is for you. Pauline, this is for you. And there's something about a God who doesn't just do things for the crowd or for, in generalities, but there's a God who's willing to make it specific and individual and apply the work of the cross into my life, into your life, and make it personal. And it's when Jesus gets personal with Mary, it's in those moments that something changes. And maybe on this Easter Sunday, God wants something about his truth to become alive in a whole new way for your life, in your situation, in your context, that suddenly it's like, oh, this is real for me, oh, this is true for me, that suddenly, I get my revelation, I get my understanding, I get my encounter with God. And it's when we get that that really the process of transformation begins. Because in those moments, our sorrow drops away and, uh, and we uh, suddenly experience a joy. And uh, in Isaiah 61, where we get our name from Isaiah 61 verse 4, talks about restoring uh, the uh, places long devastated. And uh, because we believe in a God of restoration, but also in Isaiah 61, there's a beautiful story about divine exchange, beauty for ashes, that God gives the oil of gladness instead of a spirit of despair. And the wonderful truth of the work of the cross is just like Mary in a moment with the calling of her name, experienced a life transformation and her sorrows were gone and joy came back in the same way through the work of the Easter weekend. God wants to perform a work of transformation in us. So our guilt and our shame drops away. The uh, weight of sin and sorrow disappears and we can know his freedom and his healing and his transformation. So the story starts at a tomb. Uh, it then goes through a process of transformation and it ends up with a testimony. And the word testimony simply is a story. And uh, out of uh, Mary's encounter with Jesus, she then runs back to the rest of the disciples and says, I've seen the Lord. And she starts to declare what Jesus has spoken to her. And that testimony starts to bring change to other people's lives. And uh, what I love from that is that in the culture of the day, we've talked a bit about women and how Jesus elevated the place of women in the culture of the, of the day. Uh, what was interesting in Jewish times um, was that the woman, the testimony of a woman wasn't valid in court. Uh, you actually needed uh, two witnesses for a testimony to be valid in court, and the, uh, the testimony of a woman didn't count. And yet Jesus entrusted the first testimony of a resurrection experience to a woman to go and tell the other guys. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful, the way that God radically validates and includes those who otherwise wouldn't feel validated or included? Today, you might feel like you're on uh, the excluded list. Today, you might be on your own, not celebrating Easter with other people. Maybe family hasn't worked out the way you'd want it to. Know that God values you, he celebrates you, and he includes you. And you see, out of Mary's transformation of the power of a tomb being broken, she gets a testimony, she gets a story. And that story ends up not just changing her life, but it changes the community around her. And so many times we read this in gospel stories. Think about the woman at the well, another person who was on the excluded list because of the way that life had turned out for her. 
she goes back to a local community and everyone wants to know about Jesus because they see the power of the transformation in her life. Do you know the most powerful thing that we have to share with other people is our story of a changed life. You know, sometimes I think we think, oh, I need to be qualified. I need to understand more about the Bible. Maybe I need to understand a bit more theology. How am I going to answer people's uh, questions and stories? Do you know what I have found in all my years of uh, sharing faith with other people? Uh, people argue against your theology. They'll argue against facts and figures. What they won't argue about is the power of a changed life. And in the culture of the day, uh, the story of Mary, the testimony of Mary should have been invalid, but actually it counted something because there was a power in her experience of a changed life in Jesus. And I would say this morning, if you're still on your journey of getting to know Jesus, if you know people around you who are followers of Jesus, and one of the most interesting and helpful things you can do is ask them, tell me about your story. Tell me about your experience of God. You know, John Wesley became a Christian. He obviously was the founder of the Methodist uh, movement. He became a Christian because he was crossing the Atlantic in the height of a storm. And he saw a group of people, Moravians, they were uh, followers of Jesus. And he saw them and they had no peace. They had no fear, even though uh, it, it felt like the storm was going to sink the ship. And while John was panicking, he saw peace in their lives. And he went over to them and he said, why is it you're so peaceful when I'm so fearful? And they told him the story of the reality of Jesus they'd encountered in their lives. And again, the power of a story made a change for John Wesley and it made him seek Jesus in a different way. And that led to an encounter where his heart was warmed and that led to the whole birthing of a Methodist movement that brought revival to the UK and then went global. But it started with the power of a changed life and the power of a story. Maybe today God is going to give you a moment and an opportunity to share your God story, your story of how Jesus has impacted and, and uh, changed you. And maybe uh, what God wants you to do today to do is to commission you to share your story with someone else. So a really simple Easter message today. I hope you like to keep it simple. Um, but John 20 starts with a tomb and the tomb represents death and all the ways that we've died due to our separation from God. But that story of a tomb becomes a place of transformation because Jesus has risen from the dead and he's overcome, he's dealt with. He's removed the power of all of those things. And as Mary receives it into her life, that then becomes a testimony that changes other people's lives. And that exact same process is what God wants to outwork and offer to each and every one of us. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to send you off to uh, uh, share the good news of Jesus with other people as you celebrate Easter Sunday today. Lord, I thank you that this story starts with a tomb and a place of death. And Lord, if we're honest, Lord, we all know that we've had moments where we've experienced what has felt like a darkness and a death that's encompassed us. Maybe this morning that is the reality that some of us are living in. And Lord, thank you that you reached into that. And on Easter Sunday, you brought change and transformation. And thank you we see the outworking of that in the life of Mary while, she was, uh, while her perspective was uh, engulfed by sorrow and sadness and darkness. In a moment when you called a name, you brought change and transformation. Lord, I pray this morning we might hear you calling our name and inviting us into your forgiveness, inviting us into your grace, inviting us into a new start and a new day and a new week and a new era and a new chapter. And Lord, thank you that that story of transformation then became a testimony that changed other people's lives. And Lord, I pray today and this week, we might live out of the power of the transformation we've received in our lives. And I pray that we might become carriers of good news and of love and the grace and the goodness of Jesus to others. That our own experience of a tomb 
becoming a place of transformation will become a story and a testimony that will bring change to others' lives, just like happened to Mary. In your wonderful name. Amen. Great to be with you today. Let's keep celebrating the work of Jesus today. And because it's not just a one day thing, because it's the story of rest our, the rest of our lives, let's keep celebrating it. And we'll be back with you again next week. God bless you. Have an amazing day and an amazing week.